good afternoon. Welcome to another webcast of Ameridarkly Unbridled Inquiry. And today's episode is on becoming rational, which I suppose our audience would wish that we would become. <laughs> um, the reality is that human beings are not always as rational as they would like to imagine themselves to be. Uh, just take your average sports fan as an example. Um, or look at politics, <laughs> even worse, although very similar actually. Um, some people question whether human beings are rational at all. Uh, I think we are always in the process of trying to become rational, uh, although admittedly we tend to be better at rationalization than we are at actually approaching things in a rational way. Um, I mean, obviously, if, um, for instance, I doubt that anybody has gotten married for rational reasons. <laughs> uh, marriage is usually a consequence of emotion, and then after the fact you may find good reasons for having done so. Uh, buying a car oftentimes is more emotional than it is rational, and you rationalize your purchase after the fact. Uh, well, and the salesmen even don't want you to think rationally about it. No. They want you to fall in love with it. Yes. So, I keep yawning. That's not One of the things I like about Tesla is they don't have car dealers, and so perhaps it's more rational. No, not when you have Tesla porn all over your computer. <laughs> I'll get up in the night to check, it, like if I can't sleep and I do some work on his computer. Big old Tesla web page could be delivered in three days. Yeah. yeah, if you've got that kind of money, which we don't right now. <laughs> no, thanks to multiple reasons. Yes, healthcare, children. That's pretty much it. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> If we didn't have children or have to worry about health care, we'd be fine. Yes. We'd have a Tesla. Yep, just went up again. Yes, it did. Oh, well. Um, part of the evidence against human beings being necessarily rational in many of their decision making things is, you know, just look at reality. Um, you know, watch people as they go about their lives. Plus also the simple fact that it is necessary to teach students how to think. Mm -hmm. That is, they don't seem to come by it naturally very well. Uh, we have to teach, or at least we should be teaching people uh, logic, uh, how to do research, things of that nature. Uh, that unfortunately is rarely done and we have. Yes. <laughs> um, now you've been watching um, or listening to Scott Adams. Um, Coffee with Scott Adams. Yeah, his podcast. Scott Adams is the guy that does the Dilbert comic strip, and he also does a podcast, and also it's available on video uh, on YouTube and Periscope. He does it live on Periscope, and then it goes up on YouTube later. Um, but he doesn't believe that human beings are rational at all, does he? No, he does not. He thinks that we um, make a decision, then we come up with reasons to justify our decision, mm -hmm. rather than going through the reasoning process and coming to a decision. Right. Which I would agree sometime, that probably most of the time that's probably is the case. Mm -hmm. And of course he would, and he would not exclude himself from this either. Right. That's the other thing to keep in mind. He would agree that his approach tends not to be rational either oftentimes. Mm -hmm. um, but he also believes that we're in a matrix, that this isn't reality, which we covered in another episode. Yes. So. Yeah, he's not the only one that t tends to think that way. Yeah. Uh, there are several scientists and others that have suggested the possibility, although the, there actually have been a handful of experiments done, and none of them are consistent with the idea that this is a uh, simulation. Mm -hmm. So Now he doesn't believe in free will either, but no. if you don't if you don't believe And again he's not alone in that 
there are several um, philosophers that have come to that conclusion, some scientists, and one could argue that extreme forms of Calvinism and Islam tend to be deterministic mm -hmm. in their approach. Um, I would disagree with that mm -hmm. concept, though. I think that we do have free will. It is limited. Um, we are constrained in many respects. That is, I mean, physically there are some things that we simply aren't capable of doing, as I can't flap my arms and start flying around the room. Um, and then we're also constrained by safety issues. That is, the only thing that keeps me from driving on the wrong side of the road is a little yellow line down in the center mm -hmm. of the road, but I'm still not going to drive on the other side of the road. Because there'll be a semi that convinces you you're wrong, right? That, yes. So. Yeah, you can, I mean, you can choose to jump off a cliff, but that'll be the last that's time, choice chances that you make. are. Yeah, that's that choice and other choices. Yeah, so our choices are constrained to some extent, but essentially okay. uh, we live our lives as if we have free choice. And we punish our children and other people based on the idea that they have free choice. Yes. That is, they could have chosen not to have taken the cookie out of the cookie jar. As much as the temptation is powerful, uh, temptation, <coughs> I mean, when you think in terms of human beings are very poor at um, thinking clearly. Uh, short term concerns tend to overwhelm us. That is, the pleasure of eating the chocolate cookie right now uh, takes precedence over possible consequences of eating right. that chocolate cookie. That is, we don't care about the consequences in the moment, and that's irrational. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we oftentimes make choices that do not actually maximize our well-being. Um, people talk about the nations, nation states, uh, generally speaking, uh, make choices that are in their perceived self-interest. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's the caveat, perceived. Uh, oftentimes, nations do not actually do things that are in their self-interest. They simply think they are, and then they make the choice and realize, uh-oh, mm -hmm. once they get their head speed in or whatever. Um, well, I think one of the supporting um, facts for the way Scott Adams thinks um, about people make decisions and they rationalize it, mm -hmm. that I, if you look at eyewitness testimony, eyewitness testimony is so flimsy, mm -hmm. even though people swear that's what they saw, mm -hmm. because you, you see a thing and then your brain fills in for the stuff that you can't remember or didn't notice. Yeah. So you make the decision, you know, that the car that hit the other car was blue, and then you fill in the blanks. It was a blue Ford Fiesta when it was really a Chevy whatever. Yes. But, um, yeah, well, there, there have been numerous experiments done on the reliability of eyewitness testimony and it is mm -hmm. invariably not uh, yeah, eyewitness testimony is far from being reliable. They've done some SVU episodes on that, Law and Order SVU, where um, a woman swears that that man raped her and then based on the DNA evidence he wasn't even like around her. Yeah, well I told, I think it was an earlier episode, this was from a book do not remember right offhand. But the story in the book is told about a woman that was convinced that a certain individual had raped her. Um, the difficulty with it, though, is that the person she claimed had raped her had an absolutely uh, ironclad alibi. Mm -hmm. He was on TV at the time. Yeah. Which is why she thought he was the one that raped her, because her TV was on he oh. was on the broadcast and she and her head mixed up. Which is weird that that sort of thing happens, mm -hmm. but yet it does. Yeah. We have numerous cases of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but well, I mean, you know, 
I mean, all of us probably as children, if not later in our lives, done the thing where you find, realize that there's a big hole in your eyesight uh -huh. that your brain fills in automatically. Mm -hmm. As if you use a tube and um, do it just right, you can force your brain not to do the correction properly, and so you end up with this big hole in the center of your hand as a consequence. I've never done that. You've never done that experiment? No, I've never oh. even heard of that. Yeah, it's an interesting experiment because the way our eyes work, the retina, you've got it actually a blind spot in the middle of your retina. Oh, interesting. But your brain fills it in. Well, it's kind of like with you with that detachment thing that you had. Right. That your brain eventually trains itself to see around all the little floaties. The globs, yeah. yeah all, of course, all over time, the floaties settle down. Right. But, uh, yeah. But the, at first, you had these blind spots where you couldn't see. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it went away, and part right. of that was your brain compensating. Yes, for your it. brain compensates for a lot of things, and that's one of the big things that your brain compensates for is this enormous blind spot that's in the middle of your eye. Interesting. I want to do that. It's an interesting experiment. I'm trying to look it up. Okay. I can't remember exactly how you do it. It's a very simple uh, thing to do, and it's rather surprising because the hole looks quite real because your brain is filling in, uh -huh. but it's doing it wrong. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, but it shows you what's there. It's a relatively good sized uh, hole. Um, but this is why, um, you know, the, the movie The Matrix was so useful from a philosophical standpoint is that for a long time, you know, ever since Rene Descartes at least, you had this whole brains and bats, you know, the mad scientist or whatever that's keeping our brains in a vat and then feeding us information. Wow. Because the reality of our perception I of the world... I think you said brains and bats. I'm like, brains and bats? Bats. Okay, yeah. brains in bats. B-A-T-S, not B-A-T-S. No. Okay. Um, that our perception of reality is based on our senses, which send electrical impulses to our brain, which our brain then interprets. Mm -hmm. and so that gap in our eyes is an illustration of our brain fixing that because the information is incomplete. Um, we do not have, as the technical term goes, we do not have direct apperception of reality. It's all mediated to us. Mm -hmm. um, but this goes into the whole concept of how rational we are and the process of becoming rational, which is what we want to do is try to become rational. Um, our brains are designed to help us survive in the world and to keep ourselves fed and clothed and to mate properly and all these sorts of things, but it's not designed to make sure that we are perceiving reality necessarily entirely accurately mm -hmm. uh, or that we are necessarily thinking entirely rationally. Um, one of the things that uh, as human beings are very good at is pattern recognition that has survival characteristics for us. That is, mm -hmm. you recognize the pattern of, say, a behavior of a predator that's helpful in trying to, you know, avoid being eaten or, you know, tribes or the weather or things like that. The problem with pattern recognition, you notice when you start seeing uh, shapes in clouds. Mm -hmm. That's uh, innocuous example of it. That is, you look at clouds and think, okay, that looks like a wolf, or mm -hmm. that looks like a bus, or that looks like whatever. Um, and of course, some psychologists will play the game with uh, blots, and you're mm -hmm. supposed to see what, you know, imagine what you can see in it. That's part of our pattern recognition process. Where it falls down on us is when we start, well, there's two different ways it falls down. One is what's called the bigoted mindset. Mm -hmm where you uh, overgeneralize. That is, you have a bad experience, say, with uh, an ice cream salesman, and so you decide that all ice cream salesmen are scum. Mm -hmm. And so every time you see an ice cream salesman doing something bad, you notice that, and it reinforces your belief that ice cream salesmen are evil. Your brain will fail to recognize any time an ice cream salesman does something good because it doesn't reinforce what you're believing. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Plus, you also will not notice non-ice cream salesmen doing the same bad behavior because, again, it doesn't reinforce that idea in your head. Right. This is where prejudice comes from against uh, religions, races, ethnicities, genders, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's bad pattern recognition. Um, the other aspect that uh, this will fall into is conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. That is the idea that um, part of it's because as human beings, we it's important for us to maintain control, right. have control over our environment because we need to manipulate our environment to make things function for us and work together. And so when we see bad things happen, we look for some overarching uh, explanation for it. Mm -hmm. That the reason this bad thing happened is because of some nefarious group or some nefarious idea or something like that mm -hmm. that explains why that bad thing happened. Right. And so people look at, um, say somebody gets assassinated. Well, it's never just some nut, random nutcase that happened to do the bad thing. It's got to be something deeper than mm -hmm. that. The grassy, be, knoll, the grassy knoll, the second shooter, second yeah. shooter all of these things. Uh, it has to be some nefarious group of people that are involved in it, uh, whatever. And who the nefarious group of people happen to be will depend on going back to the bigoted mindset, which group of people you've decided are bad people. Mm -hmm. And so you decide that, you know, all people that are this political persuasion or all the people that are this skin color or all people that, you know, belong to this particular organization, they're necessarily evil and nefarious, and they're the ones that are making this bad thing mm -hmm. happen. Because as human beings, we hate the idea that we don't have control mm -hmm. and that simply random <coughs> bad things can happen and that there are no good solutions to the problems. Mm -hmm. That is, you cannot prevent a nutcase from assassinating an important person. Right. It's going to happen because, I would argue, people do have free will and they can just freely decide to do something completely irrational. Now, according to Smokey the Bear, you can prevent forest fires, so, so <laughs> that is preventable, so just putting that out there. Well, and the thing is, is that this is a really tough conversation to have and not discuss politics and what's currently in the news. Well, I prefer not to, the right. reason being that once you start discussing actual political points of view, right. then you get the whole uh, sports team analogy right. type thing going on, that is, well, this is my people that I like and appreciate and I think mm -hmm. they're right and how dare you say these bad things about them and I'll show you. Right. And all thinking then goes out. Right. And so we want to avoid making people not be able to think clearly through these issues. Right. Because but it's the sad, super tempting to it go is there. Simple, very Especially with to the go death there. of a certain person in the last 24 hours and all the conspiracy theories about it. Theories that grow up about it, yes, which is I inevitable. I mean, it took no time at all. I mean, no, things, the conspiracy theories will pop up well, instantly. And, I mean, things happen quickly in the modern world. I mean, much well, more quickly than when, when Kennedy was assassinated. Well, we've got social but media But seriously, now, I mean, the, the guy was still non-responsive. <laughs> and there's already <laughs> theories about it. Yes, but we want to avoid that because people right. have already made non-rational judgments regarding whatever political point of view they're a part right. of. And what we want to try to do is to get ourselves and others to start becoming rational, mm -hmm. which well, is I to like recognize that, that is, I like the Dodgers, and the Dodgers are doing pretty well this season. They lost last night to Arizona in, in overtime. No, it's not bad. Sorry. Yeah. Um, they're playing again tonight. I um, just started a, a bias. Yeah. <laughs> But see, there's no Actually, rash. Actually, if I was a true Diamondbacks fan, I would have said D-backs, but yeah. yeah. But when you think in terms of sports, there really is no rational reason for it. That is, particularly if you think in terms like a Cubs fan or something, mm -hmm. I mean, or a Cleveland Indians fan. So you're calling your sister completely irrational like all year long? Or, no. Because she Actually, likes all the teams you like. She's Perfectly rational. That's right. No, <laughs> I mean, Cleveland has done unusually well this season. They're in second place and only a couple of games back the last I saw. But still, most of the time, Cleveland does not play well. 
Because like most of the time, the Cubs have played well, although they did win the World Series recently, which was amazing, and apparently hell froze over. <laughs> Uh, but well, generally, there were reports that Satan was at Home Depot buying a snowblower, so it could have happened. That makes sense, yeah. <laughs> um, but our appreciation for a sports team, or say your favorite singer, or what kind of food you like, these are not rational based decisions. And the reality is that most of our political points of view have about as much connection to rationality as our preferences for a sports team have. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you will see this, how emotional based these things actually are to think in terms of say people falling in love. Mm -hmm. You will have people who may have differences of opinion regarding sports that after they get married suddenly they're united in whatever team they're supporting. Mm -hmm. That is not a rational change. <laughs> <laughs> or you'll have people that are from two different religions that get married. Mm -hmm. Or people from two political points of view that get married. And after they're married, somehow they're both in agreement on whatever. Mm -hmm. This did not happen rationally. Right. Um, and so a lot of what we think is rational is not particularly. Um, and we would all like to try to deny that our religious points of view, our sports team points of view, our political points of view are, are, are all entirely based on data, facts, rational thought. Usually it's not. Yeah. Um, well, which is why well, people end up screaming at each other instead of actually carrying on rational conversations right. because it is more emotion than it is rational. Um, going back to something we talked about in the previous um, episode was, like we were talking about conspiracy theories. Generally, conspiracy theories are false just based on Occam's razor. Yes. That it is too complex, it's too, it's much easier to just say he hung himself in a jail cell than it is to say that anybody was involved. Yes. But although it's fun to speculate, yeah. and I've well, those make laughed for a good, lot today. Well, those for good movies, right. good TV shows. They have and jokes and memes. jokes and memes, but they usually don't have a whole lot to do with reality. Uh, there is a quote attributed to um, Napoleon Bonaparte that I got from Jerry Pornell, which was, never attribute to malice with that which is more easily explained by incompetence and stupidity. Right. Um, Well, and I think, too, that you have to realize that in order for a conspiracy to be successful, everyone has to keep their mouth shut. And that doesn't happen to us. There's often. so much leaking in, in Washington, in company. I mean, companies put a lot of money and energy into keeping their secrets. You know, um, well, and that... Well, an example of how bad that is. I mean, Elon Musk, mm -hmm. SpaceX and Tesla is notoriously bad about tweeting things that he probably shouldn't sometimes. Right. Um, but in Chuck order- Chuck Colson, who was involved in the Watergate conspiracy, would regularly tell people afterwards, he was convicted and they uh, formed, after he got out of jail, uh, prison fellowship. And he said that he doesn't believe in conspiracy theories because he was involved in a conspiracy <laughs> that lasted all of about a half hour. Yeah, because nobody <laughs> can keep their mouth shut. Yeah, yeah. It's, it was part of conspiracy, and it didn't last. <laughs> it's like when you tell your friend, "Don't tell anybody I told you this." Mm -hmm. That's like hitting the button to the loudspeaker mm -hmm. and just letting it out there. Yeah. So to think that this conspiracy, like think about JFK, to think that no one has come out and said, "Yes, I was one of the shooters," or "I know who the shooter was," mm -hmm. you know, it's it's gonna happen even many years down the road, like. Um, uh, the guy who was the, um, oh, which, which serial killer is it? His daughter has now written a book. Mm -hmm. She's written a book about knowing him as her father. She oh, didn't know Black him. Oh, Black Dahlia? No, no, no. Oh. But even that. But um, the, um, no, this girl, her dad was, oh, the BTK killer. Oh, well, we already knew that. He got convicted a long time ago. No, you're missing my point. Okay, I'm sorry. So, 
I mean, if you just look at it as information coming out, yes. I mean, even his daughter's writing a book about knowing him as a father, oh, yeah. not as the murderer. And so, I mean, even after the person, my point was, even after the person is dead who is involved in the conspiracy, mm -hmm. their family's going to tell. This is true. So, because there's some notoriety in it, there's some, mm -hmm. you know, might, might be able to make money off a book or just people go, ooh, really? That's cool, you yeah. know? It's so, yeah. um, stuff like that doesn't stay secret. So, yeah. um, the the idea that there is some kind of... There's only one person that has the secret, then maybe it'll stay secret. Yeah. But once you get more than one person, it's kind of forget it. Yeah. There's too much motivation to talk. But, oh. Uh, yeah, the hardest thing in the world is to be rational. Um. Uh, I confirmed notory bias, the bi bigoted mindset is one of the biggest issues that I see on a regular basis. And the scientific method was not developed until the 1600s or thereabouts. And it's an attempt to get around our human tendency to be overawed by things that confirm what we already believe. Right. Um, because the whole idea of the scientific method is that you try to get all the data possible, you make a hypothesis, and then you test it. Right. And the testing is the key to whether or not something is scientific. And the idea in the testing is not to prove the thing true. The idea in the testing is to prove it not so. Mm -hmm. That is, to break the, your hypothesis, to break the theory. Um, if you don't break the theory, that is, you run the experiment and it matches, you haven't proven that it's true, you just haven't run the experiment yet that breaks it. Mm -hmm. And so you keep coming up with more and more experiments. One of the longest running sets of trying to disprove something has been Einstein's theories. Mm -hmm. That is, he came up with his theories at the turn of the 20th century. And there have been test after test after test run, and thus far everything matches, mm -hmm. which is remarkable even though we know for certain that the theory is incomplete. Mm -hmm. So because it's incompatible with quantum uh, physics, quantum physics deals with small things, relativistic physics, science, science physics deals with big things, but they don't, there's, they don't come together quite. Mm -hmm. And so we know that both theories work really well in their realms, but there's something missing because they should all work together. Mm -hmm. But thus far, no experiments have been able to break either of those theories, which has been very frustrating for the physicists involved. Well, it's kind of like diagnosing a problem with a car. If somebody says, well, like my daughter's car, for mm -hmm. example, she keeps claiming that it does this, like, pulling action when she's, when she's driving, when mm -hmm. she's accelerating. Yes. So, but we can't make it happen. So right. as far as I'm concerned and the mechanic is concerned, it's not a problem because we can't make it happen. Once we can make it happen, and if I can make it happen, I can determine under what conditions, because I know about cars, I can determine under what conditions it happens, and I can probably figure out where the system problem is, and then take it to the person to fix it, and say, this is what I think it is. Yeah, but until, right, until you can duplicate the problem, there is no problem. Right. So even though you know there's a problem because the person has felt the problem. Yeah, there is a problem. It's just you haven't been able to get the problem to pop up to be able to be diagnosed. Right. Like it's when, like you go to the doctor and you say, well, I've got this issue, but then you've gone to the doctor and you feel fine that day. Yeah. <laughs> well, my mom's car, when, we, when she had her Toyota um, Corolla and we were going to Vegas, she made the mistake of saying, there were a ton of cars along the side of the road that ever needed to us. Well, we're in a Toyota, that'll never happen to us. And, and it, was a, it was a pretty low mileage car, so it wasn't like it was an old car like my van or something. But we're going up the hill and it was very, very hot. And all of a sudden it drops out of cruise control. And I'm like, did the cruise control break? So I redid the cruise control. And it wasn't a cruise control issue. I quickly realized we were losing power. And we're on an uphill. So, and I was in the fast lane. So I started pulling over towards the, um, the slow lane and I noticed there were some issues with the air conditioning 
And so I started checking the engine temperature. Engine temperature was fine. I'm checking fuel, were we out of gas? And so I was like, is it electrical? So I'm like, did, I'm like looking at all the systems of the car, thanks dad. And I'm, I'm playing with it before it dies. Mm -hmm. We pull over and um, everything was working on the car. When we sat there for a while, we could start it. Well, what ended up happening was um, there was a vapor lock. Mm -hmm. And so the, we called AAA because we thought we'd have to get towed into Vegas. And thankfully my mom has the super premium AAA account and we could get towed all the way there. Um, but the, he came along and he said, I think you have a vapor lock. He said, I think if you drive with your gas cap open, you'll be fine. He said, it's not good for your emissions, but just leave it open so you can get all the way to Vegas. And so um, he followed me to, cause he couldn't go beyond the next exit unless he was pulling, unless he was towing us. Mm -hmm. So um, we drove to the next exit with the gas cap, just locked into the door of the, of the, um, the, you know, the little door that goes over the gas right. thing. Anyway, so, and we had it partially closed. And so we're driving up and um, it was running just fine. And we got all the way into Vegas, thing ran fine. He said to be on the safe side, if it's really hot, he said, drive with your gas cap open. Mm -hmm. So um, we did, we drove home with the gas cap open, but ever after that, she, we never had to do it again. Mm -hmm. It was like a, it was a fluke thing. Right. But because I was able to narrow down, it's probably, the, well, it does have to do with her. Because yes, I was so. rationally able to narrow it down. Mm -hmm. um, like I wasn't freaking out because I know about right. cars. And see that was the key thing is that you knew about cars mm -hmm. and so you had a sense of what is possible that could go wrong with the car. Right. One of the issues that I see with um, conspiracy theories and some of the things that people come up with is that they're coming up with these theories without knowing the data. Right. And oftentimes they don't even imagine that they need to do any research. Mm -hmm. They already have enough information to make a rational mm -hmm. uh, choice and they don't. Right. Uh, I've seen very poorly written books that happen because the people did not do the research. Mm -hmm. uh, the sad reality is that most journalism is really poor quality because most of the journalists have no clue what it is they're talking about. Mm -hmm. That is, they don't have the historical background, they don't have the philosophical background, they don't have the economic training, uh, they've never taken course in the logic. Uh, just any number mm -hmm. of things that they completely mess up on. I have mentioned before the Gell Mann effect. Gell Mann was a physicist and he'd be reading the newspaper and every time he read an article on physics he was just shaking his head and rolling his eyes and thinking, you know, how stupid this is horrible. And then he'd go back to reading the paper and he was accepting the other articles. Mm -hmm. And he suddenly came to the realization one day that, you know, why is it that I am putting any trust in these other articles when if it's dealing with the topic that I know about, mm -hmm. it's always wrong. Right. Um, and to some extent, I see an awful lot of that. Mm -hmm. Well, let me give you another example, car example, okay. rational versus irrational. Um, my sister and I were going to a scrapbooking weekend and we were driving to um, 29 Palms and we're going out on the 10 and there's a Skechers factory store on the way out there. And so we pulled off into that and her car was, you know, fine. There were no problems with it. And so we get into the parking lot and we go through the Skechers store. It's huge. I mean, every kind of shoe you could possibly want was there and it was made by Skechers, which is like my favorite shoe brand. Only because it makes, they make my feet happy. No real rational reason for it. But yes. anyway, yeah, so, it. yes. It gives so, you an emotional Yes. Well, my feet are happy. That's all I care about. But anyway, um, so we left the store and we're driving along and all of a sudden the heat on her engine just goes way up and so we pull off and we crossed over the um, the overpass because we were going to go back um, so that there'd be like an air conditioned place because we were just like there out in nowhere and it was hot and so um, anyway but we couldn't go any farther Psh, water all over the ground so we get out and I'm looking at her car and I said, well, and it was actually kind of stupid, but I had, we, I hadn't encountered this problem since I was 16 years old. So it was a good 
what, 30, 35 years or so since I'd had that problem, and nobody's talking to us. Okay. And she, I have a friend on, but she's not talking to us. Anyway, um, so um, when we called the tow truck, um, he towed us, there was a, a Toyota dealership, like just within the amount of miles that my sister had on her AAA card, not having a premium membership like my mom. <laughs> and so he towed us to the Toyota dealership. I said it was probably um, a, a radiator hose somewhere on the back side, which was stupid because I forgot about the water pump. So it was actually, she blew her water pump. So they were able to get a water pump and put it in, and we went on our merry way. We we're a little late to the scrapbooking weekend, but we made it. And um, but she kept, she told me, and she'll still tell me to say, "I'm so glad you were with me because I just would have cried. I wouldn't have known what to do." <laughs> and crying when your car doesn't work is hardly the solution. Yeah, it doesn't really but make anything better. I knew that it, and she's like, "You know, can we nurse it along?" I'm like, "No, you've literally lost all your water. You are not taking this car anywhere." So, I mean, if it was a slight hose leak or something, you could probably keep filling it with water and make it, but we were, significant, we were far enough away from 29 Palms, we weren't making it into 29 Palms. But we could have nursed it back to the dealership or whatever. But anyway, um, the point is, is that I was the rational one because I know about cars, and so I knew her water was gone, and even though it was a stupid diagnosis, looking back on it now, like oh. when he said water pump, I was like, oh yeah, duh. But we, I hadn't lost a water pump in a car since we were, were stuck between Tulsa, Oklahoma and Joplin, Missouri that time on the way to my grandmother's funeral. So it totally escaped me that it could be her water pump. So, but anyway, um, but um, yeah, so there's a good example. of. And really it is about your knowledge level. And that's when I start getting freaked out over certain stuff, I try to get as much knowledge about the topic as I can. And um, and then it's like, okay, well now this makes sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, popular author. He's dead now. Zechariah Sitchin is a crackpot, or was a crackpot, um, and he wrote um, things on um, the idea that you had all sorts of weird disruptions in the solar system based on movement of planets and other odd things. And he made use, supposedly, of some ancient Near Eastern texts, Sumerian being one of them. And one of the things that he would brag about is that nobody had ever, ever bothered to refute him. There's mm -hmm. nobody that ever refuted anything he said. Well, there's a reason that crackpots tend to not get refuted. Because in order to refute a crackpot, you generally have to write an entire book uh -huh. the same size as the stupid book that the crackpot wrote. <laughs> and most people that are involved in the fields that the crackpot doesn't know a thing about and is spouting nonsense about, uh, for the people that are experts in the field, they look at it and think, well, it's obviously stupid. But what Sitchin wrote appealed to people that had no <coughs> idea either about astronomy, science, or mm -hmm. ancient Near Eastern history or literature or texts. Right. Um, that's an extreme example of somebody that was clueless coming up with conspiracy nonsense or theories that were also nonsense. There's a blog that I follow that um, it's a science blog and it's called Not Even Wrong. Mm -hmm. And that phrase, not even wrong, is attributed, I forget now which physicist it is that said it, but somebody had said something and his response to it was that it, it was so bad it wasn't even wrong. Oh. <laughs> the idea being that in order to correct the error that this person had uh, popped off with, there are so much other things that you would have to bring up mm -hmm. so that you'd understand why this was incredibly stupid. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the problems oftentimes in dealing with crackpots or with any kind of nonsensical sorts of theories is there's so much background stuff that you've got to bring in that it hardly seems worth it sometimes right. because it's just so much work. Well, I have friends on Facebook that will post, very intelligent friends, who will post something that is clearly wrong or clearly biased, but they're acting like it's gospel truth. And I look at it and I'm like, 
Thank that you. is way more typing than I feel like doing. Mm -hmm. And the likelihood I'm going to convince this person it's that they're wrong enough. is slim and none. So. See, that's the other thing. What happens is when people come up with an idea or if they get locked into a point of view is that's exactly it. They're locked in. They have an emotional investment in mm -hmm. it. And so people don't like to be wrong. Right. People don't like to be wrong. And the emotional investment makes it virtually impossible then for rational discussion to occur at all because mm -hmm. there's too much emotion injected in it. Um, there are certain conspiracy theories that I simply will not discuss with people, generally speaking, if they seem to be locked into it. Mm -hmm. That is, it, years past I would get weird letters from anti-Semitic people, mm -hmm. and I would try to demonstrate you know, why they were stupid. I did it in a nice way. Right, that is, I stupid. followed the, um, the way a um, diplomat does things. Right. That is, the definition of diplomat is someone that can tell you to go to hell in such a way that you look forward to the trip. Right. And so I tried to do it very nicely, but I found the nicer I was, the more loving I was, the more vitriol I was getting back, and mm -hmm. nothing was happening. And so now if I get a letter from an anti-Semite, I just blast them. Mm -hmm. I'm not even nice. Keeping in mind, you know, when people talk about, you know, well, what would Jesus do? Well, whips and throwing tables is always an option, yeah. and that's what I do with anti-Semites um, because they're completely stupid. Jesus went all um, <coughs> uh, was at Hollywood Housewives on the Virgin of the Temple because that one you know dumped the yeah, table. Yeah, it's on. also the way he approached the religious leadership generally too. Yeah. He was not particularly nice, and because there's no point, right. it was not an effect that you. And that's the sad reality is that. Rational discussion is rare because rationality is so rare. Mm -hmm. As people are so emotionally attached to certain ways of thinking that having a rational discussion becomes virtually impossible. Mm -hmm. It can be done, but it is hard. Yeah. The way that you can have an impact in changing someone's mind or getting things into a rational framework is if you can create what's called cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. That is, and the way you do it, the best way to do it is what you see in the Socratic dialogues that Plato wrote. Mm -hmm. It's called the Socratic method. And the way Socrates would do it in those dialogues is he would ask questions. Mm -hmm. And you ask questions that force the person to explain what it is they believe. And then you ask other questions about that, and you do it in such a way that they come to a point where they realize that what they're claiming here and what they're claiming here don't mesh. And when you do that, then it forces the individual to reevaluate, and then they themselves come up with the realization that this wasn't so. Mm -hmm. And what's nice about it is that you bypass the emotion then, mm -hmm. because it's their idea then. Mm -hmm. As long as you are not, if you can get your ego out of mm -hmm. these kind of discussions, it works mm -hmm. really remarkably well. But it is hard to do and it requires a lot of time. Plus you also have to really know your subject well. Right. To be able to do those kind of questions that will force the person to start thinking in a rational way. Mm -hmm. because you're asking them questions and asking them to explain. Mm -hmm. People love to do that. Mm -hmm. and so well, just asking people the about themselves is a great way to make people like you. Yeah, you get, you get their emotional investment in the idea to work for you, uh -huh. as it were. Um, but, yeah, on the Internet, that's pretty much impossible. Yeah. And, you know, look at social media. Most of it's reduced to you get these you know, little picture with some words on it, and that's the, uh, that's the amount of rational discussion that you have going on, which is not at all. Right. Um, so, one would wish that rational discussion was more common and easier to accomplish than it is, but it simply isn't. It's incredibly, incredibly difficult. In college, I had two long classes, one in uh, undergraduate and one is a graduate student on methods of research. 
And part of the purpose of that is, again, to try to get you to think rationally, mm -hmm. to get you to find out the truth of a given topic by forcing you to do the hard work of getting the data, getting the information, getting to primary sources. This is something that is incredibly rare. Mm -hmm. uh, people on the internet will post, even if they post a longer thing, it's usually secondary or tertiary information. That is, it's still interpreted and is going through um, a filter before mm -hmm. you get it. Getting a hold of the raw data is hard to do and doesn't happen very often. Uh, even people will think they've gotten it and they'll give a little snippet of what somebody said. And see, that's the other problem mm -hmm. you get. Just, okay, here's a little piece of what somebody said. Aren't they awful? Mm -hmm. Well, not necessarily. Let's see what right. the whole context of this thing is. Uh, who was it? Rishilu? Somebody from the Spanish Inquisition said, give me two lines written by the most honest of men and I'll find something in there to hang them with. Mm -hmm. You can find something horrible in what anybody says. Well, and that's what's interpret. happening in the political environment. Yeah, political well, that's the, yeah, in politics, that's the whole game. Let's find a sound bite that we can make this person look like a moron, and not mm -hmm. even just a moron, make them look evil. Right, and the people who think that person's already evil are like, yeah, there's more evidence. But then the people that like the person, they read the context, and they're like, wait a minute, hold on a yeah. second. So it's, it's very tiresome. Yeah. Uh, Gotcha. That's why I like to, when, when it's voting season, I go to Ballotpedia.org because I like to read the whole piece. If it's something that, I mean, some things are pretty cut and dry, like, do you want to legalize murder? That's not, that's not, no, no, <laughs> don't need to read the legislation on that one. But some of them are written in such a way, like, that you're not sure how you're voting mm -hmm. or you're not sure, it's like, what does this really mean? That you can actually read the piece of legislation there for yourself. And you can look also at who's for it, who's against it, because some of them are written in such legal terminology that it's hard for the average person to read. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll read through it as much as I can. I'll look at what they say it says, then I'll look and see who's for it and who's against it, and I'll kind of gauge that way if I really don't understand the actual legislation. But. Yeah, my rule of thumb generally is um, just to vote against new laws. I figure we've got enough already. Yeah. But then I well, kind of because laws don't really change people. In my orientation anyway, right. so. But laws don't really change people Which is my anyway. Bias. Yeah. Um, so. But yeah, rationale. Becoming all we can do as human beings is move towards becoming rational. Uh, we are not ever as human beings going to arrive because there's not one of us that's the Vulcan. Mm -hmm. And even the Vulcans have emotions, they've just learned how to suppress it. Mm -hmm. It's odd to talk about a fictional character in this way, but um, still. Fiction? I thought it was true. <laughs> yes. They actually have found planets around uh, Spock's world, homeward Vulcan, is supposed to be around Epsilon on Eridani, and they actually discovered that there is a world in the habitable zone around that star, but it's probably not actually Vulcan. Okay. <laughs> you kind of have to wonder, though, about Gene Roddenberry, what he really knew, because, you know, the communicators, those were the early flip phones, you know, it's like, what did he know? You're just guessing. Yeah. It's science fiction. And then the people that saw the communicators went, oh, we can make phones like that. Well, that actually tends to be what happens. Yeah. That is, science fiction often times inspires the engineers. They look at it and think, well, why don't we see if we can make that happen? Mm -hmm. um, so. Well, like warp drives. Yeah. Would that have been a thing if it hadn't been for Star Trek? Well, there's always, in science fiction from the very beginning, since we've known for a long time, since Einstein, um, that you can't travel faster than the speed of light under normal circumstances. But yet, if you want to tell a story where people are going to other stars, mm -hmm. you've got to figure out some explanation for how they're doing that. Right. And so there have been a variety of things in science fiction to try to explain that. So Warp Drive was one of them. That was not unique to Star Trek. Oh, okay. Um, but what was funny is several years ago when um, Stephen Hawking uh, was going to do a play himself in one of the uh, Next Generation uh, episodes, they were showing him around the set and they showed him the warp drive. Um, he 
said, and um, he looked at it and said, well, I'm working on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, he, there's a book called... Well, there's a book called The Physics of Star Trek. No, there's a book... Um, didn't William Shatner write it? I'm working on that. Then didn't know. That, no. It wasn't William Shatner. But that, the, that phrase comes from that. I um, thought there was a book called I'm Working on That, and it was the things that came out of Star Trek. Well, ideas that are being, yeah, there is something like that. Yeah. I don't remember what, who wrote it. But yeah, uh, science fiction has tended to um, inspire uh, scientists and engineers um, to try to see if there's some ways to make certain things happen. Um, but yeah, science fiction authors um, do not have greater insight into science than anybody else, but they're writing imaginative stories and so they let their uh, imaginations run wild. And sometimes they come up with things that may or may not be possible. Um, and of course you do have some people that have worked on the concept of warp drive, but that's getting off the uh, topic for today. Yes. Um, oh, I know, I, my mom texted needs me to call her later, which I was going to do anyway, because oh. I was supposed to call her on Thursday and just too busy, too tired. Okay. Oops, why do I keep going? I don't know. But anyway, rationality is hard to do consistently as a human being because we are very much the slaves to our emotions. And rational thinking is to some extent unnatural. That is, thinking logically, avoiding uh, the biased mindset, the cognitive um, confirmation bias, all of these things. Those are things that we do naturally, pattern recognition. And all of these things have a value in certain settings, but they can really mess up things trying to discuss issues. William Shatner, I'm working on that. Shatner. A trek from science fiction to science okay, so fact. It was Shatner Go me. Yep, you're right. Go me. I remember the title. I did and I think I've read the book even. I didn't remember it's the author. It's all about being right. Yes it is. But see that's what again why emotions are so uh, get in the way of rational discussion. Mm -hmm. Because we get invested in being yeah. right. We want to be right. We don't want to be wrong. And so even if we think that we might be wrong, we'll just keep hammering away mm -hmm. at our point because we don't want to be wrong. Right. We don't well, want to win. And, the, and, in, and in a discussion format even, there is a tendency to want to win. Mm -hmm. Well, there's that verse game. in the Bible that says a man does what's right in his own eyes. You're not going to do something if you clearly think that it's wrong. Right. Yeah, nobody, let's say. And, or they, they've justified it they justify in some way. some way. Even heinous criminals they think they're doing the right thing. Like, At least at the moment. Right. Well, there's they have like a reason people for that doing. kill, you know, there have been murderers who kill prostitutes. And it's like, well, you know, I'm making the world a better place by killing these prostitutes. So they have a justification, mm -hmm. which makes it okay to do. Right. So in in some form well, or fashion, they the, made uh, it okay in their was heads. the one story, uh, the TV series, um, where the guy killed serial killers. Oh. What was that? It was on for several seasons on HBO or Showtime or something. What was it called? But anyway, yeah, he was justifying killing people because he's killing murderers. Right. Yeah, there was something else I was going to say about that. Yeah, but um, that's exactly correct. We find ways of justifying heinous behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, that is. Mm -hmm. You see this in politics, that is, I'm going to say or do this horrible thing to this person who is my political opponent because, well, my political opponent is just evil and he's going to cause all these problems, and so whatever I do to him or his followers is okay. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, we can easily justify bad things. Right. And, again, it's an example of not being rational rational. We are choosing to become something other than that. Uh, I actually
actually had a dream one night. It was one of those school anxiety dreams. I dreamt that I had really seriously screwed up at work, mm -hmm. and I spent the entire dream trying to figure out how I could come out on the outside. <laughs> like, who could I blame for the entire uh -huh. dream was me trying to figure out how to make myself look okay uh -huh. in this That's whole thing. And it had nothing to do with losing my job. It just had everything to do with not looking like a bad person. Yeah. And that's human nature mm -hmm. and why we are only becoming rational and, and are not actually fully rational right. um, because that's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Protect ourselves, protect what we think is so, be the winner, all these things. Mm -hmm. um, everything is like sport, it seems like. <laughs> <laughs> As you look at what goes on with fans watching a sporting event, too much of life is like that. Mm -hmm. Even things that we think are fully rational, as we all recognize that there's nothing, rat, or at least most of us would recognize, that when you're thinking in terms of watching a baseball game or football game, the rationality has very little to do with what's going on. Right. Well, think about Inflate Gate. If you talk to a Patriots fan, it all makes perfect sense, uh -huh. and it's all fine. You gotta have the ball a little squishy so you can hold on to it in that temperature or whatever, you know, and whatever the reason, lame reason was. But then you talk to, uh, it was, um, who were they playing? It was um, some loser team. <laughs> no, it was. Well, they um, lost the fight. Oh shoot! They've got that thing um, that that coily symbol thing. It was the um, New Orleans. Oh, they, the Saints? Wasn't the New Orleans Saints they were playing during an inflate gate? I do not remember. And the, the since fans... I'm not a, since I'm not a fan of either team... Well, I'm not a fan of either really team either, but I like head. football. Yeah, you like football so, more than I do. See, baseball is what I care yeah, about. Yeah, I don't care about that. And there's um, no rational reason for it. That is, the reason I like baseball is for my dad like baseball, he played fast at softball, he's very good at it. Uh, he was ambidextrous, so he could pitch with either hand and could hit with either hand. I played baseball growing up. I was pretty good at baseball, thus I liked baseball. Oh, it's deflate gate. Ah. Um, not inflate gate. there's no rational reason for it. Oh, it was the Indianapolis Colts. Ah, okay. Okay, I was completely off. Oh. But I'm sure the Saints were playing that day, and that's why I thought it. It has to be the case because I couldn't possibly be wrong. No, of course yeah. not. Yeah. So, but um, anyway, but you talked to a Colts fan, mm -hmm. and it was you yes, know horrible. he planned it that way. Tom Brady can't possibly lose, so he has to cheat because he's getting old, yeah. and all this kind of stuff. And it's like it's all nefarious. And yes. So, but if you're a Patriots fan, it's all <clears throat> perfectly logical and reasonable. It it's simply happens. an error. Yes, it's no just a mistake. Deal. No big deal. Yeah. Just get over conspiracy yourselves. Conspiracy or not conspiracy. Yeah, exactly. Your exactly. Your emotional investment on whichever yeah. side. Okay. Well, we are once again towards the end of the broadcast. We are. So, well, we want to give the... Yes. Amir Darkly, Unbridled Inquiry is a ministry of... Quartz Hill School of Theology and of Quartz Hill Community Church. Quartz Hill School of Theology, of course, being a ministry of Quartz Hill Community Church. I'm sure there's a better way to say that. Yes. They're both ministries of Quartz Hill Community Church. The School of Theology has a website, theology.edu, and you can take classes on there for free. If you would like credit for them, there is a nominal fee that is charged. You can take classes online or in person, we're actually one of the first colleges, weren't we, to offer classes online, like straight up? Well, it was see. early it was on. Pretty early on. It was in that the nineties is... when you started. Well, that, we wasn't started. It? The website began in 1992, and then we got our own domain name, theology.edu, back in 1994. Uh -huh. So we've been online for an extremely long yeah. time. Yeah. And one of the older websites. Right, and all the information is up there on the website. You can take any class you want. It no longer looks like it came from the 1990s. Yeah, we have finally updated. got updated. He yeah, spent finally, a lot of hours on it. Yeah, that. I finally updated it. It looks a lot better. It actually works on tablets, phones, or yeah. computers. So when you're standing in the grocery store line, you can get a degree in theology, <laughs> just say it. But anyway, um, and then uh, Quartz Hill Community Church has its own website, which is... Um, the main one is 
courtshillcommunitychurch.org or courtshillchurch.org or little littleblue-church.org. So like three domain names that all feed to the or same for, place. Or you can do theology.edu uh, forward slash QHCC, all caps. Yeah. So anyway, so um, we do um, uh, live stream our services at 11 o'clock Pacific time on Sunday mornings. If you are not in church at that time, or you are looking for a church and you want to test drive us online, you can do that through Facebook. Um, if you want to um, come to church, if you're looking for a place to worship and you live in the Antelope Valley, we are at the corner of 51st Street West and Avenue K, and church starts at roughly 11 o'clock. It's roughly because we just start a little after. But we're not big on punctuality. No. But um, anyway, so we would invite you to join us uh, if you're not somewhere else. Um, and next week we'll be on Liberty. Ah, uh, give it, give me Liberty or give me that. Yeah. My kids just learned what Liberty means this week because we um, we do the I write out the Pledge of Allegiance and they read it with me and then they tell me what words they don't know. And then the next day I give them the synonyms for those words and I put it up with sticky notes. And liberty and justice is freedom and fairness for all. And they're like, oh, that's what that means. <laughs> so um, anyway, yeah, so we did that this week. First week of school. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. And, and we'll see you next week at roughly 4 o'clock. Yep.